of the voting wars? How do we move beyond partisanship and polarization, or should we? And welcome to Allowed at Central Library. I'm Louise Steinman, the Program Director for the Library Foundation of Los Angeles, which makes all of these free allowed programs possible. The Library Foundation, if you are not familiar with it already, and I know many of you are, uh, supports the great work of the Los Angeles Public Library and free access to ideas and information, which is a cornerstone of our democracy. So we feel like we want to provide a forum to talk about these uh, crucial issues. And we invite you to become a member of the Library Foundation and support programs like Allowed and literacy programs and tutoring for kids. We have our Allowed bookshelf set up after the program. And if you join tonight, you're welcome to a book by tonight's author, uh, Rick Hasen, uh, Hassan, and otherwise you can pick an, a book by any other allowed author that we have there on the shelf tonight. We hope you'll consider becoming a Library Foundation member. I also want to introduce Ken Brecker, who's the president of the Library Foundation, right there. And now I'm going to introduce our distinguished panel. Uh, we will open up to you for questions uh, after the panel has uh, had time to be in dialogue for a while. We will circulate microphones as we do record for podcast, and we ask that you wait until the microphone comes to you. We'll try and take as many questions as we can. So our um, panel consists of, at the end there, Rick Hassan is Chancellor's Professor of Law and Political Science, University of California, Irvine School of Law. Is that correct, Rick? Yes. Okay. He was. Uh, <laughs> We were talking about Loyola Marymount, so I got confused. He was founding co-editor of the peer-reviewed uh, Election Law Journal and is a frequently quoted expert in the press on election laws. And he is the author of the just published book, The Voting Wars, From Florida 2000 to the Next Election Meltdown, uh, which he will be signing afterwards in the lobby. To his right is Connie Rice, co-director of the Advancement Project. Connie is a civil rights lawyer known for successfully tackling problems of inequity and exclusion in unorthodox ways. She's received more than 60 major awards for her work in expanding opportunity and advancing multiracial democracy. And it's also nice to know she also has a first degree black belt in the Korean martial art Taekwondo. <laughs> Uh, to her right is Leslie Berestein Rojas, who's the lead reporter for KPCC's immigration blog, Multi-American, on which she reports on immigration and its influence, cultural, political, and otherwise. She formerly covered immigration from the U.S.-Mexico border for the San Diego Union-Tribune, and in addition, she's reported from throughout the Americas and has written for the LA Times, the Orange County Register, and many other publications. Um, we have one other panelist who is somewhere on a freeway coming up to Los Angeles, but I will introduce her anyway. Nicole Steigar made her political debut as a deputy field director for the California Republican Party in 2006. She's traveled all over the country working on campaigns for the RNC, the NRCC, and as a regional government affairs representative for ACCCE, Clean Coal Initiative. She currently serves as secretary for California and Young Republican Federation and is executive director of the Orange County Young Republicans. And our anchor here, Marty Kaplan, holds the Norman Lear Chair in Entertainment, Media, and Society at the USC Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism, where he was associate dean for 10 years. He is the founding director of the school's Norman Lear Center. He was Vice President Walter Mondale's Chief Speechwriter and Deputy National Campaign Manager of Mondale's 1984 presidential bid. Marty has worn many hats. He was Vice Pre President of Motion Picture Production at Disney Studios as a screenwriter and producer, and has been a featured blogger on the Huffington Post since its inception. You'll see his commentary around town. So, Marty, we turn it over to you. Please take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, and uh, thanks for coming. We're going to have some fun, I think. It's a, it's a good moment to be talking about this. Um, the uh, title, as Louise said, is The Voting Wars, How Do We Move Beyond Partisanship and Polarization, or Should We? And I'd like to just lay my cards on the table. I was the one who added, or should we? <laughs> And uh, Nicole, uh, we, we hope the uh, freeways will be kind to her, uh, because if not, I'm going to have to find myself in the position of role-playing a Republican in the group. So, <laughs> um, but perhaps you'll all help me. In, uh, uh, <laughs> no chance. No chance. 
So I'm going to uh, uh, start with an anecdote. Uh, today I was uh, uh, driving. I had uh, one of the cable channels on uh, uh, my car radio, and Harry Smith, uh, now an NBC reporter, was being interviewed by uh, Chris Saliza from the Washington Post, and uh, it was to promote a piece on uh, 30 on the Rock Center uh, this week. And uh, he was asked, well, you've been all over the country working on this piece. You've talked to people everywhere. Um, what are you finding about the American people? And he said, well, two things, really, I I'm finding. One is that they are sick and tired of all the bickering. They want to end the gridlock. They want people to work together and solve our problems and be bipartisan. The other thing is how people are so polarized, they can't stand what other people are saying. <laughs> and they're not afraid of saying so and, and standing up for their beliefs and holding fast to them. And I thought, well, there it is. Um, so I want to uh, uh, ask about bipartisanship first. Uh, what is it? Is there a version of it that uh, you would uh, say is good for democracy? What does it look like when bipartisanship is working? And by way of a counterexample, I just want to uh, tell one story. Um, uh, when uh, Senator Richard Lugar from Indiana uh, was defeated in his primary recently by a Tea Party candidate, uh, uh, Richard Murdoch, um, Lugar issued a, a bitter statement on uh, the night of the primary saying that uh, his whole career had been about reaching across the aisle, working together, and uh, that his, the guy who won, Murdoch, his embrace of an unrelenting partisan mindset is irreconcilable with my philosophy of governance and my experience of what brings results. Well, uh, Mr. Murdoch went on all the cable channels the next morning, and so he was asked about this, and his response was, I have a mindset that says bipartisanship ought to consist of Democrats coming to the Republican point of view. <laughs> and then, just a couple of days ago, it turns out that he is now, Murdoch is running an ad in Indiana in which he says, uh, uh, the, the, uh, he has the lieutenant governor of Indiana saying on his behalf that uh, Mr. Murdoch will work with Republicans and Democrats He'll work with anyone. On the other hand, when asked, could he name one Democrat he would work with in the Senate, he couldn't. So my question is, uh, bipartisanship has become a, almost a political issue itself, a little meta, but you know what I'm, I'm talking about. Um, and uh, this is a jump ball for any, any or all of you to take. Um, what does bipartisanship look like when it's happening? Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan. It looks like uh, McCain and Feingold. So at the end of the day, even though you had your party fights, at the end of the day when you decided to get something done for the country, uh, you automatically put aside the, the, the bickering and the, and the party lines and you, you got together and you and you either went out for drinks, and it took, took them getting a little bit drunk, and they had their whiskey, and Reagan and Tip O'Neill especially. And uh, they, would, they, they would hammer out a deal, and they would get something done. They, they would get business done that advanced the interests of the American people. That's what it looks like. I mean, we know what it looks like. We, we've seen it, you know, for the last 60 years. You can see lots of examples of it. I just named those. That I named three or two. I can't even remember. Middle aged, I can't remember from one moment to the next. But um, we know what it looks like. And, and, and there's an ethos that says uh, we need to get something done for the people. There's, there's a really strong drive to get business done. And, and it has to be something significant. Um, what is it that, that Tip O'Neill and Reagan worked on? I can't even remember. I mean, you know what McCain and Feingold did. 
Um, there was there's some others. You probably have a lot of the other uh, duos in mind because. But but in terms of the deals they're doing, I mean, I understand the social ethos, but what were the deals? Did they split every difference down the middle? Did did they decide some people are going to get some things and some another? What were the compromises? How did that work? Oh, every which way you can imagine. Um, and, and depending on the issue, you can give up certain things and you can't give up certain things. And then they would only focus on the areas where there was mutual give. Um, I mean, I, you know, you, 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 everybody's done it. I mean, everybody in this room has done deals and done compromises. And um, I used to sue LAPD. I now have a parking space at the headquarters. I mean, you can't <laughs> get compromising. And I, I, have, I mean, I, you know, Chief Beck is going to give me a badge. I mean, I have totally gone to the dark side. As well. <laughs> so, so it was a mad, and, and it took huge compromise. It took huge compromise. But, but I had to sit there and look. I said, you know, I love to fight. And um, I do beat them in court. And I said, is the idea for you to win your cases while your clients are losing their lives? Or do you want to help the police uh, get to a point where the community trusts them and then both the cops and your clients are safer? So I had to stop being a combatant and a gladiator, which I hated to do because I love to fight. And I had to you know, put aside what I liked and I had to think, okay, how do we forge a new dynamic so that we can carry out this consent decree? We have to carry out this consent decree. So there was a different set of goals. And once we decided we could stop warring and that for the good of the city, for the good of the department, and we made the way for Chief Bratton, it's probably the best service I've ever done, was to clear the way of Chief Parks and allow Bratton to come in. And, and so that, that, that was huge compromise. I mean, it doesn't get any bigger than that when you've been fighting for, for I mean, we've been fighting each other for 20 years. I mean, and it was before Johnny Cochran. I mean, they, we've been fighting LAPD for 70 years. So, Rick, is this a, an extinct species? Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, there's, a, there's a great study that these political scientists do uh, of uh, every senator and every uh, member of Congress's ideology. And so they give them a rating on a scale. It's very accurate. Uh, and uh, there are now no uh, Republican senators who are more liberal than any Democrat in the Senate. And there are no uh, Democrats who are more conservative than any Republican in the Senate. There's no overlap. And uh, uh, one, one of the things I was recently looking at was votes against the nomination of uh, Supreme Court nominees. So Scalia, Kennedy were confirmed uh, unanimously. When you start talking, uh, and Breyer and uh, Ginsburg had eight or nine votes against them. When you look at the recent votes, you had 42 votes cast against uh, Alito. Uh, votes in the, in the 30s against Sotomayor and against uh, Kagan and against Roberts, who are all on the merits, eminently qualified to be on the Supreme Court. You look at the few who crossed over party lines. They are the Lugers, they're the Ben Nelsons, they're the, with the Olympia Snows, the ones who are leaving. So I actually think, you know, the Senate was the place for compromise. With its filibuster rule, you had to get 60 votes to do everything. Uh, but the people are getting what they want. The Senate is starting to look like the House, and the moderates have disappeared, and so there's not really space. Even John McCain uh, and Orrin Hatch uh, have shifted their policies. So McCain, for example, the, of McCain-Feingold, uh, voted with the rest of the Republicans to filibuster a bill which would have uh, fixed some of the problems we have with our campaign finance disclosure laws. So there really is no space. Uh, for compromise right now. So it's, 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 it's a very tough time in the, in the Senate. So Leslie, I was going to, you've been on the immigration case for a while and Senator McCain's name came up. Right. Could you talk about partisanship, bipartisanship, and uh, gridlock on that front? Well, going no further than uh, the DREAM Act, right? I mean, Development Relief and Education for Alien Minors, which has just basically been around since 2001. The original one was bipartisan. And over the years, you know, little by little, the Republican support has dropped off. Or of course, it went absolutely nowhere when they, they came to a vote um, in 2010. Um, one question that, 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 and this is, you know, in immigration, that's really become the case lately. Now, you, you go back to IRCA and you talk about the steel making. 
some of the reasons that we have some of the loopholes that we have in that law were because of the bipartisan deal making that was going on, in fact, to take care of business interests. But that's changed very much. And there was one question that I wanted to, to send back to you, which within, what's the context in which this has happened? I mean, I don't want to take over no, your, no, your I, job No, no, crosstalk is encouraged. Yeah, but, but, but you can explain, how has this happened? Why? What's the, the broader context? Plus, she's a radio interview, so you can't help her. Sorry. <laughs> I think part of it has to do with the fact that we have strong political parties. Uh, I mean, the, the country is polarized, and um, with strong political parties that are ideologically apart, further apart than they ever were. I mean, we can. This traces back, I think, to uh, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which caused the uh, uh, Democratic South to disappear, and so the parties uh, where there used to be a lot of overlap in terms of ideology. Uh, the parties have now uh, defined themselves ideologically um, along with party, and there's not room for compromise. And with the, the strong political parties, campaigns are run in a no-holds-barred, no-compromise position. The, the quote from Mordock is very telling, because it says that, uh, my way or the highway. And uh, you, know, you can find Democrats who are just as ideologically driven uh, on that side. There are very few uh, in the middle. Uh, and uh, I, I, it, it's, it, it is a, uh, it, you look at someone like uh, Obama coming in and saying he's going to move beyond partisanship. Well, this was how he sold himself in the first election. He's not selling himself that way anymore. He, he's given up on that possibility. And so even someone who comes in committed to that, Washington is so broken that it can't be fixed with just sheer will. There's, there's just not the numbers there. But on the Obama front, one could argue that uh, he's, he lingered too long uh, in the belief that if only uh, he talked more, played more golf, that he would find a way around it, and that each time that he was rebuffed, he looked weaker rather than more what the public wanted to, to break the gridlock. Do you think that's what happened, Connie? Did he linger too long? I, I, I think he had the delusion that it was possible. I think we're at a period of time right now, and I might be totally wrong about this, but I see this, and, and, and I see, I was looking through Obama's eyes and thinking that maybe he could, you know, inspire people to go beyond the, the, the meanness of, uh, uh, of zero-sum politics. But I think that we're in a period, and I would love to hear whether you, because I, I'm not a Democrat and I'm not, I'm not a Republican or a Republican either, and I sued probably more Democrats than I have anybody else, so they wouldn't have me as part of the party. And, um, you know, I, I can't see myself joining a party that had Strom Thurmond and, and um, David Duke in it. So I'm, I'm not, and, 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 and so I, I, I really am not part of a party. But in looking at the situation, and I'd like to see whether everybody else agrees, I really looked at it as, you know what, if there's one rule of combat, and I do like to fight, I'm a combatant, you know, that's why I'm a litigator. But when you can't fight anymore, you gotta, you gotta kind of suck it up and decide, okay, I've gotta play a different role. I'm gonna actually compromise, and we're gonna go peacefully, and we're gonna get something done that's constructive. And so I know how to do that if I have to. I prefer to fight. So when you look at the fight that we're in, what I thought was, you know what, my side, well, no, the other side was playing Gladiator Raw and Smashbox, right? And my side was playing Mother May I. And when you've got that kind of differential in outlook and what you think your mission is and how you're going about achieving your political ends, it can't work. So as part of the law firm that's doing six of the cases, again, uh, we had to help Gore when we realized that Florida was going to be a mess. You know, Penda Hare, my law partner in, uh, in Washington, left her turkey in the oven to go down there to help Gore. And now, you know, how many years later, we're now, we have six cases just for basic equity in, in access to the ballot. Right. And when you look at those cases, it is awfully hard, as nice as it would be to be equanimical about, you know, well, this side doesn't do this and this side doesn't. And there is one party that has decided that its survival depends on making sure that the other folks can't vote. 
So that's Smashbox, that's Gladiator. And um, it's not about compromise at that point. You, you talk about the voting wars, it is war. You're absolutely right. And so I would love to compromise, but you can't compromise when the other side has decided it's on a mission of annihilation because its viability depends on locking out as many people as possible, making sure that folks cannot vote, and that now, they... I'm, I'm Nicole, and I'm disagreeing with that characterization. <laughs> of course but you are. I'm just I would putting, be very a, disappointed putting a pin in that, yeah. because I also want to bring Leslie in and then turn to Rick uh, on the point that Connie just made about uh, voting suppression. Um, on this issue of compromise and uh, one side bringing a, a, a knife to a gunfight. Well, you know, what I was thinking as you were saying this is, and you know, it's too bad that Nicole isn't here, um, there is this, you know, as, as this, this has progressed, this phenomenon that we see now, conservatives find themselves with this real dilemma, right? Because the demographics of the nation are really changing. So what do they do? Do they actually start trying to find some way to appeal to this, this new constituency, or do they stick to this hardcore constituency, to this base that is, you know, very much, it's, you know, it's, it's this red meat base that's going to stick with them. But what do you do? And that's one of the dilemmas that Mitt Romney's had. And he kind of backed himself into a corner, and there's no getting out of it now. But, but that's where sure is. He, uh, I don't know. My <laughs> campaign is about the 100%. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, he also kind of was hoping that if he were Latino, it might be a little easier for him to win the White House. But that, that's, that's, that's going on too. So, um, yeah, no, he, he has backed himself into a corner, and there is no getting out. But, um, but, but please, anyone else want to elaborate on this? Well, I, I wanted to uh, pick up the, the thread, and, and Rick, if I could just uh, set this up from the prism of journalism for a moment. Um, the New York Times ran a front page piece uh, about these issues and got a lot of criticism for being even handed. Um, the uh, public editor, Margaret Sullivan, uh, contacted the national editor of the Times, Sam Sifton, and says, how do you respond to this argument that you're too even handed? And so here's his response, there's a lot of reasonable disagreement on both sides, he said. One side says there's not significant voter fraud. The other side says there's not significant voter suppression. It's not our job to litigate it in the paper, Mr. Sifton said. We need to state what each side has. And then the public editor slyly goes on, keeps talking to him, and uh, she says, while he agreed that there was, quote, no known evidence of in-person voter fraud, end quote, and that could have been included in this story, quote, I don't think that's the core issue here. So uh, that's the cue of a lifetime. Yeah, well, first of all, uh, you know, the, the author of that piece, I spoke to him when he wrote that piece, is a very smart guy, Ethan Bronner, who uh, was the... Times Bureau Chief in Jerusalem. So talk about he knows covering, about yes, and talk about the Times being attacked for being one-sided by both sides. I mean, he's <laughs> dealt with this before. So was he gun shot? Well, you know, the two days after that story appeared, and it was kind of uh, uh, equivocal about the voter fraud issue. The, the story was, was not, is there voter fraud? The story was trying to, to describe all of the litigation. And you know, the amount of election litigation, as I show in my book, has more than doubled since 2000. And we can talk about why that is. I think it's part of this polarization. But it wasn't a story about, is there voter fraud that would support a voter ID law? Um, but then, three days later, the Times ran the longest piece I've seen, not in the magazine, on a group called True the Vote, which is a Tea Party offshoot out of Texas that's now national, that is claiming that there's a tremendous amount of voter fraud. Uh, but the article goes on to talk about them chasing phantom voter fraud, and it does a very good job of pointing it out. So let me just talk a bit about, is there voter fraud? Because this is a central question in my book. So um, I focus my book on the, the period of the last few decades. Certainly in the earlier part of our country, we've had lots of instances of voter fraud. There's the famous 1948 
uh, election of Lyndon Johnson in Texas, where uh, the votes came in from Alice, Texas, that put them over the top, and they were nicely, they came in, all the voters signed in alphabetical order. It was very convenient. <laughs> so, so we have had these instances in our time, but what about uh, these days? So it turns out that voter fraud is a small but real problem, and it almost always involves one of two things, either election officials who are on the take. So we had a recent story here out of Cudahy, small city here, where the election officials uh, were getting the ballots as they came into City Hall. They were steaming them open. If there were votes for the incumbent, they sealed them back up and counted them, and if there were votes for the uh, uh, challengers, they threw them away. So that's a good way to steal an election, the people who count the votes. And it doesn't happen that often, but it happens every year we hear a story here or there. Uh, the other way to steal uh, an election is through absentee ballots. Uh, absentee ballots are the best way to steal an election because you can verify how someone voted, you can pay them, and you can collect the ballots. One of my favorite stories involves a, a uh, county sheriff race in Dodge County, Georgia, where the two candidates' campaigns set up tables at opposite ends of the courthouse, and they bid on absentee ballots. <laughs> for, they went for about $20 each. So that happens, and I say every year, I see one or two or more stories about absentee ballot fraud. In fact, uh, the 1997 Miami mayor's race was reversed because of 25,000 ballots that were questionable. Mm -hmm. Okay, but voter identification laws, which have become all the rage, uh, which have been passed with the exception of Rhode Island, uh, they've been passed exclusively by Republicans in legislatures and opposed exclusively by Democrats. Voter ID laws target a specific type of fraud, which is voter impersonation fraud. So I go to the polls, and I claim I'm Marty Kaplan, and I uh, cast my vote. This is an exceedingly dumb way to steal an election. If you were trying to steal an election this way, you'd have to find enough people to go to the polls, pretend they're someone else, expect that you're not going to be recognized, hey, you're my neighbor, hey, that person died two years ago and still on the rolls, and you'd have to, you couldn't hey, go that's the a voting Disney booth character. with them. Yes. So, um, so I look for a... A, uh, over the last generation to find a single election anywhere in the country where uh, impersonation fraud could have affected the outcome of the election. Couldn't find a single case. You have an isolated instance here or there where someone does it. There's a case in Texas right now where mother takes teenage son to vote for dad. He's senior. Uh, the dad's senior. The kid's junior. Signed in. It was not a concerted effort to steal an election. I don't know what it was, but so we had, there's a, there's a news consortium out of, from the Carnegie Foundation called News 21. They looked all across the country. They contacted every prosecutorial office in the country. Tell us about all your election fraud cases. And so there were about 400 and something absentee cases. There were 10 cases in the last 12 years of alleged impersonation fraud. So. Voter ID laws are uh, aiming at a problem that doesn't exist. Yeah. Now, and, does voter suppression exist? Is that a problem? Absolutely. Otherwise, how do you explain this juggernaut of voter ID laws? Um, I, I, and I agree with the analysis. Uh, you have, I, I think the in-person voter fraud is 0.000025% of, of it. It just doesn't exist. So why would you have ID? Now, if you were worried about the fraud or, or, or undermining of the integrity of the elections, you would go after the absentee ballots. You notice there are no laws going after the suppression of absentee balloting. Why? Because that kind of balloting favors your voters. And so this, this to me is a partisan way of getting rid of the other side's voters, more of them. Well, in the interest of trying to raise some conflict here, Rick, <laughs> is it your position that there is an equivalence between the lack of voter fraud and the lack of voter suppression? Or do you think there's this but not that? All right, so first of all, I'd say that I think that for the most part, for Republican legislators who follow the issue, they know that this is uh, not going to prevent a whole bunch of fraud. And I think it's, uh, there are, are essentially two motivations for the laws. One is to moderately suppress Democratic turnout, maybe on the order of 1%, and I'll talk about the numbers in a second. Um, and second, uh, to uh, turn out the vote, excite the base, your election's going to be stolen from you to fundraise. All right, so uh, that's the intent. How effective is it? I'm not convinced uh, that the amount of actual disenfranchisement by these laws is all that high. And by disenfranchisement, I mean people who face an insurmountable 
Uh, We've heard about a, a 900,000 people in Pennsylvania. Right. 750,000 people in Pennsylvania, according to the state's own estimates, lack ID. That would be acceptable to uh, cast a ballot. And the state Supreme Court just sent the case back because the state Supreme Court doesn't believe, it appears, that, that the state can get its act together in time for 2012. But all the justices on that court agree that voter ID will be fine once you get the IDs out to people. So there's a big problem in Pennsylvania because of the timing issue. You know, you don't uh, premiere your screenplay on Broadway. You want to roll it out in a small election. And here they're talking about uh, deciding to roll out something brand new during, you know, what is, could be the most important election of our lifetime till the next presidential election. Right? <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, when you look, if you look at Indiana, which is one of the first states that passed one of these tough laws, you don't see millions of people disenfranchised by these laws because some people who lack ID don't vote. Lots of people who don't have ID could get the ID. Uh, but Democrats are concerned not just with actual disenfranchisement, but with casual voters, voters who have less of a connection to the system, who are not going to bother. Judge Posner, a controversial judge on the Seventh Circuit, called these voters the what the hell voters. The voters are just not going to bother. And I think Democrats are worried about those voters too. And Democrats also use the claims of voter suppression to turn out uh, the vote, to, cl to claim that the election is being stolen. And the rhetoric on both sides ratchets up the partisanship and makes you know, there are statistics that show Democrats think that the way the election was run in 2000 and 2004, very unfair. More, many more Democrats than Republicans. But if you look at the Washington governor's race in 2004, where the, first the Democrat was declared, the Republican was declared the winner, there was a recount, the Republican was declared the winner again, there was a court case, and, the, and then the Democrat was declared the winner, Republicans think that the election was unfair. So if my guy won, the way the election was run was fair and square. If your guy run, there was some foul play. So. It, creates a very bad aura of uh, distrust. Okay, so we're talking about bipartisanship as a political issue, voter fraud and voter suppression as a political issue. We are divided in even more ways. We're divided by either on, on purpose or uh, in fact, uh, or in accusation by in race, by class, uh, by culture, by sector, uh, by what reality is, and, and certainly by, by issues. And Leslie, I wanted to ask you, you, you were writing the other day about one of the less commented on moments in the uh, now notorious 47% uh, uh, video, uh, in which uh, Governor Romney said that uh, uh, he wished he had been Mexican, uh, because it would have been easy street. And, uh, the, and uh, this, evening, this evening was the first debate between Elizabeth Warren and Scott Brown, and at one point, uh, for a certain length of time, the conversation went to, Scott Brown took it to, the topic of uh, Elizabeth Warren getting to where she is by uh, faking the amount of her that was Native American. So uh, on, on both those fronts, something about uh, do you deserve it, are you a moocher, is affirmative action reverse discrimination? Let me hit on that, because actually, yes, right. Romney even brought up Elizabeth, somebody else brought up Elizabeth Warren, and actually the way it goes is that during, yes. during this whole conversation that was being taped, um, you know, he began talking about his heritage. And you know, for, for everybody knows, right, you know, Mitt Romney's grandfather and father, they were born in Mexico. Because? Because uh, they were Mormons <laughs> who left in the 19th century for Mexico because they wanted to practice polygamy. They couldn't do it in the US, it had been outlawed, so they went to Chihuahua. Uh, and, uh, and then of course his father, George Romney, was born there, came to the US with his parents during the Mexican Revolution. Now interestingly, they retained their US citizenship not really because they wanted to, but because Mexican rules at the time barred them from obtaining Mexican citizenship. So they actually came here with U.S. citizenship. They, they, Mexico at the time had um, uh, what they call it, sanguinis. It was a right of, right of blood. You have to have a Mexican bloodline to be able to be a citizen there. So they came back as Americans. And so this is one of the reasons why, you know, Mitt Romney, there are many reasons why. Nobody can really understand. He's played it very badly. But, you know, he, he has this whole history in Mexico, his family does, 
And he's almost, the way he's come off is almost kind of distancing himself from it. You know, he's always said that maybe it would make him seem disingenuous to claim himself as Mexican-American. And, you know, of course, culturally, he's not Mexican-American. But he really just didn't even bring it up until he was pressed on it. So that's the background. Um, during the speech, you know, he starts talking about his background and saying, you know, again, you know, well, gee, you know, if it had only been Mexican, because, God, you know, maybe that would help me win the White House. Not that we've had anybody who is remotely Latino come close to the White House, but um, <laughs> whatever. And then he goes on talking about, you know, it would, it would maybe be, you know, I'd be better off. It would maybe help if my family was Latino, which, of course, again, what he's appealing to is, once again, you know, that base, that red meat base, those people who were very angry because were it not for that fill in the color, that, you know, black, Asian, brown kid, their kid would be getting into Harvard. And that's where he's going with that. That's the way that that was pretty much interpreted, and that's the way it came off. Mm -hmm. Did it? Yes. Okay. All right. So, anyway. And the Elizabeth Warren point. And, and of course, and somebody says, why don't you pull an Elizabeth Warren? <laughs> that was somebody in the audience shouts that. And then he goes on to talk about, to tell the whole story of Elizabeth Warren, you know. Now, nobody really knows that she has really benefited from, and she said she was 132nd or 116th, you know, but I mean, nobody, there's nothing substantiated that she's benefited from that. But it, it's again this, you know, people of color have it easier somehow because we have entitlements. And that's kind of what, what, what it's bringing him back to. He, in a way, you know, he's talking about the 47%, and he was talking to that same audience about entitlements, about people expecting a free ride, basically. So, so Con Connie, do you yeah. see this uh, nativism being <laughs> just as uh, pernicious now as ever? I find him baffling. I mean, I, I, you know, Mr. Cayman Islands tax shelter, I'm not gonna show my tax returns, is complaining that poor people and the elderly don't pay income taxes. I find that astounding. That's rich. I mean, that is really rich. I, 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 I find it Nicole absolutely is talking amazing. about redistribution now. It's, well, you know, it's not a question of whether we redistribute. It's a question of what, in what direction and for which groups. And, you know, right now, We've been redistributing upward, and 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 so that's what we've been doing for 30 years, and it's been Democratic and has been Republican and Republican um, uh, uh, administrations uh, that have done this. I mean, it's been an incredible journey of watching how you galvanize power and concentrate it for the very very few. And uh, my friends who who as as I, I was with some of them on Martha's Vineyard uh, this summer and. They're my investment banker friends. I mean, I'm embarrassed to say that they were at Harvard with me, and they were the first class that got in, like 20 at a time, to Harvard Business School, and they just hit the markets at just the right time. As Bill was explaining to me, Connie, we could never have done this at any other point in history, and we'll never be able to do it again. But we made boatloads of money because we got rid of Glass-Steagall, and we, got, we gained all of the rules of the, of the street, of Wall Street. And at the same time, we ended up getting the reins in, in, in Washington. Was your cell phone camera running? No. <laughs> These are my friends. I, you know, I wasn't going to out him. But, but it was fascinating. And, you know, he's feeling kind of guilty about it now. So he's going to start supporting me. And he says, come on, <laughs> you did the right thing. And, you're, you're, you know, you're ready for Skid Row right now. And you don't have any kind of retirement. So we're going to help you. But, but you know, his analysis, his analysis tracked mine, which was that my friends have completely gained the system. And they're both, they're, they're Republican and they're Democrat, it doesn't matter. They are the elite and they own the rules. And when you own the rules, you can change the rules. And that's how they made all these boatloads of money and gained all these systems and gambled with our pensions and so forth and crashed this economy. These are my friends. I'm very embarrassed by it. And um, I, you know, I, so, so they're quite, they're quite clear about it. I mean, and the, and these are, I mean, I'm very proud of, I'm, 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 I'm kind of torn because these are African American and Latino friends of mine who went to Harvard and Harvard Business School and they're, you know, lording it uh, uh, with the other Wall Street overlords. And, and, and they, 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 they own houses in the Hamptons and the Vineyard and they now allow me to come like, like one of those 
didn't they have those little monkeys that used to dance? <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, they invite us to the vineyard and they have us give our little dog and pony shows. And, you know, we're like those little monkeys for the organ grinders at this point for my former colleagues. But they do admire what we do and they're very glad that we're trying to help this democracy work. They're very proud of that. So, you know, I mean, most story short, I'm, I'm astounded by both sides' ability to revel and feel slight, just a little tinge of guilt, about how they have gained this system. And these are my friends. They're very, very smart. They graduated at the top of the Harvard B School. Um, they've been on Wall Street for 30 years. I've been on Skid Row for 30 years. <laughs> they've been on Wall Street. I mean, they were much smarter than I was. And, and they've got the homes and the money to prove it. And they've got the planes, the private planes to prove it. So these are Mitt Romney's colleagues, and they are of color and, and just as privileged as everybody else. So it's, it's fascinating to me that the only speech in either of the conventions, and I told Condoleezza she did a fantastic job at the, at the Your speech. Your second cousin. My second cousin. I thought she was fabulous. And, and you know, I, she's family. Uh, had she been accused of war crimes, I'd have defended her. So you know, she's family. I, it doesn't matter. I, I will defend Condi. I love her, and she's fantastic. Um, and I told her she did a great job. But the one speech that got me in either, or really reached me in either of the conventions, was uh, Sister Candles, yes. you know, nuns on the bus, mm -hmm. and then Elizabeth Warren, who actually yeah. expressed outrage at what had happened. They basically did casino capitalism and tanked our economy. Mm -hmm. And there will be no one who pays any price. So, you know, I, I we, wanna, need to, we need to think about what our political system is actually delivering. I, I want to bring Rick in. Uh, but take a slightly different angle, Rick, and I want to quote something from your book. Uh, in all this, in, in this, uh, these wars, uh, we live in a new world in terms of uh, technology, social media in particular, the way in which social media has uh, amplified or, or had an impact on this. I just wanted to uh, quote you and, and, and then uh, ask you to comment on that. Um, Truly, Rick writes, during a political battle, to know you is to hate you, especially behind the relative anonymity of the internet. And you also say, uh, now anyone with a cell phone can broadcast to the world that the Waukesha County elections clerk should have a missile shoved up her, I'll stop there. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for stopping there. Yeah, so, um, one of the things that was happening as I was writing the book was the Wisconsin recall. Uh, not, the, not the Scott Walker recall, um, but the first set of recalls. There were actually a series of recall elections in Wisconsin. You know, it was, people in Wisconsin are so nice. Uh, how could they fight like this? Even in Wisconsin now, uh, and I've heard this from a number of people who work uh, uh, in elections in Wisconsin, it's, it's become a pitched battleground. So I was watching um, in real time. My book starts out talking about the Waukesha, I'm sorry, that was corrected when I was it's spoke Waukesha. Chicago. It's Waukesha. The Waukesha County Clerk in, um, uh, in an election the summer before who had, uh, this was for the, who was going to control the state Supreme Court, the Republican and the Democrat. Uh, uh, the Democrat was ahead by 200 votes uh, as the sun came up and Republicans were yelling about voter fraud and then this clerk uh, comes forward and she said, I had all the votes for the election uh, stored on my personal laptop, and um, I forgot the entire city of Brookfield. Uh, and when you add it in, it's actually the Republicans ahead by 7,000 votes, not the Democrat behind by 200. And the person who was supposed to vouch for her uh, said, yeah, everything looks fine. She was a Democrat, but then uh, the next day she released a statement through the Democratic Party that said something like, uh, I'm 80 years old, I don't know anything about computers. The numbers Kathy showed me seemed right, but they, they seemed to add up, but I'm very, very confused. And, and so this, and it turned out that the clerk had worked for the Republicans in the legislature, including the guy who won the election thanks to the votes she found. And so this created an atmosphere of distrust uh, among Democrats, obviously, by this. There was a later investigation which said, uh, what I talk about in the book, Hanlon's Razor, this was not... Uh, don't attribute to malice that which can be explained by incompetence. Right? <laughs> but when it comes to elections, we are always seeing the other side as engaged in malfeasance. And so I watched uh, Twitter while the recall elections were going forward after this, and again, 
the Waukesha County clerk was late with the returns, and there were calls by Democrats for her head, or other parts of her body, and, um, uh, you know, it wasn't just on Twitter, he said, people are just blowing off steam. In the middle of the night, the, the, the chair of the Democratic Party issued a statement talking about a dark cloud hanging over the election and, and uh, 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 you know, something foul going on. And that statement was later withdrawn by the morning it had been taken off the website, but we had captured it and we had a, a copy of it. But it just showed that if we have another close election, unlike Bush versus Gore in 2000, when we had barely had an internet, and it took me a half an hour to download the opinion from the Supreme Court's website. Actually, it wasn't even the Supreme Court didn't have a website, it was from the Washington Post website. Now with social media, everybody is a critic, everybody can be out there. And I think that what we've seen in Egypt, what we've seen in Iran, what we've seen in London is that Social media conversations can lead to social protests. Now, it wouldn't surprise me, given the rise in partisanship and the rise of social media, that if we have a very close election like 2000, that it goes into the streets. That, that's a very sobering thing to say, and I, I'd love to, to hear your reaction. I mean, Rick talks about social unrest and the real possibility of it, and you sound kind of pessimistic in, in the book. So, uh, I, I'd Just like a little. <laughs> I just I'd like to ask uh, Leslie and Connie, do you think that there is something that may happen as a consequence of voter suppression uh, or all the other suspicions uh, that we've been talking about, which could lead to something in the streets? I'll let you talk about that first. <laughs> I want to think about that one. Yeah, we do need to think about it because you don't. You do. I, I mean, I, I can. Yeah. Can I imagine a scenario where where it leads to to street action? Yes, because I do think that the message is starting to get out, at least in the minority communities, that there is a targeting of them, and that uh, they really don't want this president to succeed. They were open about it. They stated that their goal was to see him fail. Um, now, they also want to see the voters fail. They don't want to see them succeed in casting a ballot, and that's beginning to filter into the black and Latino communities. And so, with that kind of messaging getting out there, it starts to get a, a, a racial hostility feel to it. And that's not very healthy. Uh, it's not good. And so you, you and, and I get it, I get it. I mean, for these folks, you can, they can't win by appealing to these new demographic groups. They don't feel that they can communicate to them. They don't feel like they're comfortable with them and they don't really want them as part of their party and they don't see them as part of them. And so therefore the reaction is, let's suppress them, let's put them in a box, let's push them in a corner, let's make sure they can't vote and let's, and let's do everything we can to make this president fail. And so in the minority community, the feeling is that there's something extraordinary about the opposition to this black president. That, there, that there's a level of disrespect and a refusal to accept the outcome of the election that we haven't seen in other elections. Now, I would actually disagree with that because the first president that I saw that against was when I was in Tennessee and I turned on the TV channels and heard the vitriol against Bill Clinton. He was a class traitor, and he was a traitor to the white Southern race. And the hatred against him was just as strong as it was against Rockefeller. So as a class traitor, I saw it first against Clinton and then against Obama with an added racial tinge. So when you see sections of the electorate who will not accept the outcome of an election and who have dedicated themselves to the failure of this elected official, then the bonds of the democratic compact begin to fray really, really quickly. So it's not just the setup of racial hostility and racial paranoia and making, and just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. Once the minority community starts feeling that way and they start feeling like this black president is being particularly disrespected and ignored, then we're setting ourselves up for some pretty stupid stuff. So does that have any resonance from what you've been seeing? It does. I mean, I, I, I agree that this, this sentiment is, is already there. Uh, and, and, and also, what we were talking about earlier, just in this comment, you know, just as exemplified by this comment that Mitt Romney made, I mean, there is a real divide going on. Because, I mean, you know, right now, I mean, especially, especially the GOP is seeing 
their, their constituency is, is dying, is aging, something's got to give, but you know, they don't know how to reach out to these new people. Yeah, they, they don't know how, they're not sure, they don't necessarily really want to, and so they're kind of still going on, going to this again, this dying constituency that is becoming, because of, you know, the, because of what's happening, you know, at the national level, increasingly afraid and hostile, my God, you know, there's a black president, and the Latinos are getting amnesty, and you know, so there's that, there's that fear, and there's that hostility, and there is just this, you know, this tension. Um, so could there be social unrest? Yes, although I guess I want to bounce the question back to Richard is, what would it lead to, especially after we saw this whole sort of fizzling out of Occupy, you know, where would this lead? Well, you know, I, I talk about this in the context of a, cl a close election. My, my book ends with something called the Election Administrator's Prayer, which is, Lord, let this election not be close. I don't care who wins, just let it not be close. And so right now, I'm looking at the Electoral College, and I'm thinking I'm not so worried about the, the, this unrest in terms of the presidency. Uh, I mean, the control of the Senate could go on that, but I don't think that would be the same thing. But I'm thinking in terms of if control of the, set, uh, of the presidency. If Romney turns it around enough that we're not sure going into election day how things are going to go, let me just give you two possible scenarios. Here's one scenario. Uh, Florida and Ohio have both cut back on early voting. And now, there are lawsuits that are pending. I'm not thinking it's likely, sorry to say, I don't think it's likely that those lawsuits are going to succeed. Uh, in the, aside from the, those, uh, we'll see, but uh, <laughs> uh, if there are, if there are, uh, uh, if there's not uh, uh, early voting, and uh, you know, there were uh, programs called Souls to the Polls to bring African American churchgoers' rights to uh, vote the Sunday before Election Day, which will be gone, then it's possible we'd have very long lines at the polls on Election Day. So one of the ways we avoided the big problems in Ohio in 2004 when there were not enough uh, machines in Cuyahoga County and other places, is that we had early voting in 2008 to spread things out. So you could have a situation where there are lots of people at the polls are uh, on election day because early voting's been cut back. They're not able to vote, so... And lots of challenges. Yes, yeah, so, so, so they, they have true the votes in there and they're challenging. They're only in the black and Latino districts and the lines are out the door and so the advancement project runs and tries to get a judge to uh, extend the hours and then it goes to the Sixth Circuit and they're divided on party lines, it goes to the Supreme Court. That's scenario one. Here's scenario two, which is even worse. In Ohio, they have a problem where uh, th their, their election administration is so bad that they have tens of thousands of people who cast provisional ballots. That is, if you go to the polling place, your name's not listed uh, or there's some kind of problem and you want to vote anyway, they'll give you a provisional ballot and then they decide later if it's going to count. Federal law requires you to be given the ballot, but not that it be counted. So, uh, in Ohio, if, uh, according to the state Supreme Court, if you have to cast a provisional ballot because you've been sent to the wrong place to vote, which might just be the wrong table in the gymnasium, your vote doesn't count. Even if it's completely the fault of a poll worker. So, uh, in, in the book I talk about the poll worker who sent the person to vote at the wrong table because the poll worker thought 798 was an odd number. Because it has a 7 and a 9, they're both odd, and 8 is even, 2 odds, 1 even, it's an odd number. Um, a federal district court has just said that this violates the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution. This case could still be pending on Election Day, and if we're waiting on a pile of ballots, I mean, you can just imagine what it would be. It would make. Florida look like a picnic. I mean, the idea that someone is going to be disenfranchised because of poll worker error uh, is, is, is frightening. And so this, these are the kinds of scenarios. Now, as I said, right now, the Electoral College, I'm not so worried. But you know, my book, uh, why did I write this book now? It's because people only pay attention just before the election. So if it's not 2012, it'll be 2016 or 2020. It's going to happen again. We have had close elections almost every election since 2000. Coleman Franken, you've just, there have been lots of them. Yes, uh, a, 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 in a moment we're going to open up to questions, but kind. Okay, I just wanted to ask, do you think that, and this is one of the solutions that I was going to, that for federal elections to vote on a, either constitutional amendment or some kind of uh, uh, national legislation to establish an actual right to vote and then establish procedures that govern federal elections and force the states to come up to that standard because you'd have to set up the systems to accommodate, um, you know, early voting, uh, uh, easy access to uh, absentee balloting, all of the things that you ought to have if, if voting is a right instead of a privilege, which is what they're trying to make it is into a privilege, and have that for federal elections. And then that would start to drive 
the discussion about access to the ballot and the ease of voting to a much higher level and make it about the federal franchise. Yeah, I, I, I actually, uh, I don't think we need an amendment. I think amendment could actually be counterproductive because it would judicialize the question of what the right to vote is. What I'd like to see, what I propose at the end of the book and which I say I don't expect to see, is a, uh, a federal agency, a non, the way they do it in every other mature democracy, a nonpartisan agency that administers our elections, uniform federal ballot, everywhere you go in the country, run by a nonpartisan agency. And um, the government doing all the voter registration and paying all the costs, and couple that with, and this is the part you won't like, a national voter ID card, where people, if they want, can use a thumbprint. And because, it, it's voluntary, but you, you, know, you may forget your card, but you won't forget your thumb. This is a proposal I like to say that unites Democrats and Republicans against the proposal. Republicans <laughs> hate the universal voter registration side, and Democrats and privacy advocates and, and immigration advocates don't like a national ID card. But I think we need to rationalize our system, we need to take partisans out of it, we need to make it uniform. At the very least, we need a uniform ballot and uniform yes. rules for federal elections. Yes. But there's no movement towards that. Whenever there's been election reform in this country since 2000, the exception of Democrats and Republicans coming together to make it easy for military voters to vote, there has been, it's all been partisan. Republicans want voter ID laws, they want to cut back on early voting, they want stricter rules on, to, to do voter purges, to cut out non-citizens who are supposedly voting in our elections. And Democrats want election day registration, they want to make it easy for everybody to vote, and they're not really concerned about purging, they're not really so worried about the ballot uh, having errors in it, because they're worried more about trying to fix those errors that's going to cause disenfranchisement. We need to have a logical way to run our elections. Which we don't there are people with microphones who are ready to come to you, and I will let them do their thing. Um, can you comment on this scenario? Obama wins the presidency because Mitt Romney keeps putting his foot in his mouth, and the House of Representatives and the Senate bo are both Republicans, uh, or you know, end up being Republican. Uh, is the government going to uh, come to a standstill? Who would like to take that? Well, I'll say, it, 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 the government's already at a standstill. <laughs> we, have the, we have the fiscal cliff coming, right? So we, something's going to have to be done, and the Bush tax cuts are going to expire unless Congress passes new legislation. So that's going to put some impetus for compromise, even uh, if there's a Republican Senate and a Republican House. I mean, I think the most likely scenario is Democrats barely keep the House, but of course Republicans have the filibuster, so that's not, that's not much of an advantage for Democrats. Um, either way, uh, there's going to have to, because of the Bush tax cuts expiring, there's going to be some room, I think, for a short-term compromise, but long-term I think it would look very, very bad. Questions? Yes. Uh, the topic for this evening's discussion was uh, voter wars, how do we move beyond polarization and partisanship, or should we? But I didn't hear anybody address that question. <laughs> Basically, what you spoke about was, was reinforcing what we already know. Polarization exists, and uh, partisanship exists. What I was hoping to hear was, what can we do to move beyond that? Would each of you speak to that briefly? Would each of you speak to that briefly? Yeah. Uh, I think that we did touch on the fact that we're in the middle of the partisan wars and that uh, because we're in the middle of them, we have to continue to fight them. Mm -hmm. To get out of them is going to take some kind of emergency or brinkmanship because we're approaching some kind of Armageddon, a new Armageddon line in the sand. Um, I'm thinking that also what might move us closer to a more adult approach is if there's a decisive, sort of unmistakable message from the electorate that, you know what, we're not going in this direction or that, we're going in this direction. And if, for example, Obama wins and the, the Republicans lose their bid to really move the Senate closer to them, then maybe the message will be given that, look, you, you, you had a pretty clear shot you should have been able to take him down, and you couldn't. Maybe, maybe that pushback, as, as my colleagues say, if we don't push back and let them know that they can't get away 
with pushing the country even further right. Although for me, the question is, how in the world did we get this far right to begin with? That's, that, that's amazing to me, is how far the country has moved. So I'm, 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 I'm thinking that the, the thing that will move us toward the more adult questions of how do we get out of this dysfunction are going to have to come about because of new deadlines or some new crisis that bolts, that, uh, uh, vaults us into a more adult conversation. Leslie, you want to take You know, something happened today, actually, in the House, that I, you know, is a good example. Um, you know, legislators are going to have to take some calculated risks. And, you know, there, there's going to be some alienating of constituents that's going to happen. For example, today you had a vote on the um, uh, STEM visa bill, right? Um, this was a GOP-sponsored bill that the idea is to try to get um, graduates and professionals in you know, they call STEM, you know, areas of science, technology, math, um, to be able to stay, make it easier for them to stay in the U.S. Um, and there was objection really from both sides of the aisle. We had Daryl Issa who was saying, you know, hey, we're already too generous to immigrants. Um, but you had Democrats talking about, well, wait a minute, you know, this is clearly, again, this is, you're trying to get a certain quality of immigrant, you know, I mean, because immigration isn't really just about the rule of law, there are class and race issues involved, right? Um, you know, why, why, what about the people who are, you know, working in the fields, working in the factories, and you're getting this sort of like, you know, very well-educated kind of immigrant, why don't we, okay, so for example, a way that this could be made a bipartisan bill is trying to maybe make, a, you know, some room for, a guest worker plan along with the STEM, make a compromise. You know, this would, this could make it a little bit easier. Now, this doesn't really happen these days for reasons that you express, but in part it's because, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, some of these legislators don't want to take that risk of alienating their constituents if they move across the aisle. So, how can these risks be taken, basically? You know, I do think that it's not as though senators and uh, members of Congress are voting against the interests of their constituents. They're polarized because their constituents are polarized. Right. And uh, uh, Connie talked about external force as being something that could move us to a different place. And I, I agree that that's uh, the most likely scenario. I talk about an election meltdown worse than Bush versus Gore as something that could move us beyond. But there's also the possibility of an internal change. And I think here about the Republican Party. So today, Senator Schumer made a comment that um, some Republicans have pulled him aside, um, paraphrasing here, it says something like, uh, you know, if, if Romney loses, the centrists are going to take back over the party. Now, uh, you know, I, 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 whether that would happen or not, I don't know, but given the demographic factors, the long-term health of the Republican Party, you know, you can imagine a split between a more centrist Republican Party and a Tea Party where the Tea Party eventually is either forced out of or decides to leave the Tea Party wing, the Republican Party, which would leave you know, a moderate right party and the, what was left of the Republican Party, a far right party, and a moderate left party in the Democratic Party. So I mean, that is a possibility. And then this new moderate Republican Party would be more willing to compromise mm -hmm. with voters. So to the gentleman who asked that question, thank you for holding our feet to the fire. <laughs> Next question. Hi, thank you. Um, I, I just wanted, wanted to know if you could, if all of you or any of you could speak to um, the media's responsibility and, uh, and, and maybe even technology's responsibility in the, the pitched nature of the political landscape right now. And the fact that, that maybe 10, 15 years ago, there was simply more space and more time to, to think about you know, what you were gonna say, let's say the next morning, um, instead of rushing out uh, things on Twitter and immediately causing, you know, battles. Um, I'll take a crack at that. Uh, I think the most important factor uh, in modern life is the quantity of information that there is. Uh, the amount of information in the world produced in 2004 was equal to all the information produced in the world since the beginning of time until then, and it has doubled every two years since then. And so the game for anyone is to get attention, because the more information, the less attention. So in that world, when marketers, candidates, entertainers, you name it, are all about getting attention, then the question is, what gets attention? 
and the answers uh, include the things that got attention when we were roaming the savannas looking for food. Danger, scaring us, gets our attention. Sex, surprise, uh, stories, narratives get our attention. Uh, so there's a kind of fever pitch to acquire that, and I see that cycle getting tighter and tighter and tighter, and the ability to pierce that and say, wait a minute, let's talk about this. You're changing the channel. Someone's, you're on to the next thing. So I think the quantity of information and the connectivity that we enjoy has uh, been an enabler of the fact that uh, the quality of discourse has become all about getting our attention in the discourse. Anyone else want to pick that up? I was going to say that I'm, I've started a paper, uh, an academic paper, on a constitutional right to lie in campaigns, which is <laughs> so, I actually think there is one thanks to the Supreme Court uh, this past year. But, uh, but uh, uh, I've been looking at the fight over fact checking. I'm not a media person, but it's amazing. I call this the four Pinocchio election because you have, you have, you, the, you have PolitiFact rating things from true, mostly true, down to pants on fire. There seems to be a pretty common one. Uh, and you have uh, the Washington Post uh, rating things one to four Pinocchios. And uh, as of today, um, Obama was at 1.96 Pinocchios to Romney's 2.33 Pinocchios, based completely on the subjective uh, views of Glenn Kessler, who's the fact checker. But, uh, but there's been a rebellion, especially on the right, against fact-checking, which is kind of odd to me because, you know, the idea of moral relativism, there is no truth, was commonly an idea on the left. Modern lefties. Yeah, so um, uh, with the rise of the partisan press, Fox News, MSNBC, partisan blogs, um, people are not getting their information from Walter Cronkite or the Los Angeles Times, and where they're getting it from sources that they agree with already, and there's an echo chamber effect, and so I think that kind of builds into it. And so, you know, it used to be, we've got the facts and we'll argue about how to spin them, but now we don't even agree on the facts. Mitt Romney's pollster was quoted as saying, we're not going to let the fact checkers dictate to us. <laughs> or the facts. <laughs> it's pretty amazing, I mean, which means that as consumers of media and as citizens, we've got an extra duty, which is to cut through this noise and to actually set out the facts. I'm sorry, facts matter. And reality matters. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's surreal. Uh, you know, it, 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 I think John Stewart did the best on this with John Oliver, uh, you know, basically saying, well, John, I'm going to change it. I'm going to change it. I, I, you know, it doesn't matter that it isn't so. I can change it. And you simply create an alternative reality. And that's what's happened with the Republican Party, is that you've got a faction of the Republican Party that is just creating an alternative reality. Now, the wing of the Republican Party that my cousin belongs to is still grounded in reality, may not agree with where they come up, but they do actually care about facts and they do want some semblance of reality. That's, so it's not all Republicans, but what you've got driving one major party is this ability and this need to create an alternative reality and you simply make up stuff. And that is different. That's different from, from what we had 30, 40 years ago. And as, as consumers, as voters, as citizens, we have an obligation to insist on a certain level of reality. All parties spin. They all lie to some extent. But not all of them are making up an alternative reality. And we've got to call folks on that. And we've got to insist that our media outlets, no matter what you listen to, actually pay attention to the reality, because if we start creating alternative realities and insisting on them, there really isn't going to be anything that we can agree on. It's, it's, it's really difficult for consumers of media today dealing with that, because there's just so much flying at them, like you were saying, you know, and, and it just, it's, and they are going to, you know, the Foxes and the MSNBCs of the world, and it's really just flying at them. It's, I mean, what, what I, what, what I hear people say sometimes is, really blows me away, you know, and cutting through spin is just part of what we have to do, but we're in the position to be able to do that. I mean, no rant and no slant, right? <laughs> no rant and no slant, right. It's cutting through a lot of spin, yeah. Uh, to what extent do you think that the extreme partisanship is a function of the primary system where a 
sliver of the electorate, but a very motivated sliver, can put people like Sharon Angle and Christine O'Donnell and Mordock and Aiken on the Senate ballot and essentially pull those Senate candidates to the right in an effort to try and hold on to the seats just through the primary battle. And to what extent also do you think that this kind of environment should be really a, a clarion call for a third party? Oh, you mentioned uh, uh, Angle, she lost. Uh, uh, no, but they won. Oh, oh, yeah, but I'm saying in terms of the, uh, the general election, uh, O'Donnell lost. Aiken, I think, if he doesn't drop out, is likely to lose. Mordock, it was actually a poll today that showed the Democrat ahead in Indiana, which kind of shocked me. But so the question, if, if Republicans do nominate more extreme candidates, uh, there can be a correction in the electorate. I mean, this is one of the reasons, I, I wish Nicole were here, this is one of the reasons why the Republican Party has been less successful uh, in the state is because they nominated more extreme candidates and voters didn't go for it, which is why moderate Republicans supported the move to the top two primary in California to try to um, provide a path for moderates to get elected. But, but certainly what happened to John McCain, I think is a, a, an exhibit A for what happens to presumably moderate Republicans who have been pulled to the right by the primary challenges they've had. Well, well, Connie, the California system has been revised in part in order to try to prevent that and, and move parties to be more moderate. Yeah, and we're still seeing the results of that. You know, it's the, the, the verdict isn't in. So, you know, it, it, we, as voters and consumers of this, this pathetic diet that we have for our democracy, um, we can move the meter. And so we are in the middle of some experiments right now, as you said, Marty, and we'll see. We shall see. Marty, over here. Uh, hi, uh, very interesting. Um, I wanted to address Citizens United case where, um, and then recently the Minnesota Copper King case, I, I have these fantasy dreams that Robertson is going, oh my God, look what I did, but then, <laughs> but then I don't see anything done about it and I'm wondering the effects that you think that that will be overturned when you hear what the Koch brothers are doing, what Adelson is doing, all this billions of dollars to, to buy all these states and that hasn't been addressed in is there any hope that Roberts will have a wake-up call or there's new new laws, uh, new cases coming down the pipe that would say, let's do something about this? I mean, I don't know. I just wanted to address Citizens United's effect on this whole thing. Thank you. Well, I think the best chance of getting Citizens United overturned is that you end up with a Democratic president who nominates someone to replace uh, Antonin Scalia or Anthony Kennedy. Beyond that, I don't think you're going to see change. The, you don't see an amendment either? Well, you know, an amendment requires a supermajority in the states. It's not going to get out of the Senate. You know, this is Mitch McConnell's signature issue. There's, there's, you can't even get disclosure. You couldn't get a single Republican vote to fix our, the problems with our disclosure laws. So, um, now, I think the biggest problem with Citizens United is not that it's going to buy the election. I'm not really worried about uh, President Obama being drowned out. He's, you know, if he has a bad year, he's going to raise $600 million. Really, I mean, that's, he raised 750 million last time. He's gonna get his message out. What I'm worried about with Citizens United is the, how it skews legislative priorities. What it does to members of Congress who either change their positions so that they're not uh, the next victim of a, uh, a buy from an Adelson, or uh, if they wanna fight the, that side, then they have to curry up with their friends who are gonna do this and change their position in that way. And so both the Democratic and Republican Party will skew legislative priorities towards the interests that have the money. Right, exactly. Yeah, a constitutional amendment may be worth going after on this. We have two more questions, Marty. Yes. One up there and one more. Um, as one of those uh, nasty non-citizens who they're worried about voting, uh, I grew up in a parliamentary system where when someone loses, you're kind of out of power and you have to regroup and re-emerge. Um, and it's, it's very different here in the States. I'm wondering, are there any structural factors in kind of the American system of government that keep parties from hitting rock bottom and saying, well, we have to compromise, we have to go to the table, which kind of keep them hanging on and willing to keep trying, as opposed to reassessing what they, what they believe and how they're approaching the issues? 
There's an interesting new book by Thomas Mann and Norm Ornstein called It's Even Worse Than It Looks, where they say that <laughs> the legislature is completely dysfunctional. And, and they propose... And, uh, but they're not even handed in assessing and blame for that. No, they're not. And in fact, uh, once the Washington Post gave them a headline for their op-ed that said the Republicans are to blame, their book started selling. <laughs> <laughs> but um, and they've taken some criticism for that. Uh, but they, what they propose is to have more moderate voters by doing things like uh, easier voter registration and um, uh, um, easier primary rules and to try and bring moderates in. I don't think that's what's needed. I think the problem we have is one of a lack of accountability. So when, when things go wrong in this country, the Democratic president can blame the Republican Congress and the Republican Congress can blame the Democratic president. If you look at other countries, you have a uniformity, of, you know, and so, you know, short of moving to a parliamentary system, it's hard to see how we can have more accountability. If, if we had a bad four years, but Democrats controlled the entire government, it would be much easier for voters to say, this is a referendum on the Democrats and vote them out or not. But we don't have that. Thank you, very, very interesting discussion. Uh, a question to the uh, panel. Have you now or ever have been or know anyone that is a member of the Electoral College? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Rick, perhaps you can uh, bring us up to date. I think it was in the 1990s when there was a very heavy rhetoric about abandoning the Electoral College or replacing with something else. What, how's that going? <laughs> there is a movement called the National Popular Vote, which is trying to get states, and California is one of those states that's actually done it, to pass laws where if you get a majority of, electro, of states representing a majority of electoral college votes, not a majority of states, a number of states representing a majority of electoral college votes, the, all of those states would pledge to cast their ballots in line with whoever the winner is of the National Popular Vote. Now, Maybe it's not surprising, every state where this is passed is states with Democrats <laughs> controlling the legislature and opposed by Republicans. Small states, Republican states, don't think this is a good deal for them. Uh, if it ever passed, there would be a huge constitutional question raised as to whether it's allowed, whether it violates the compact clause of the Constitution. But, uh, you know, if Mitt Romney won the popular vote but lost the Electoral College, maybe you'd get some momentum <laughs> on the Republican side. For I don't see it. Rick is a professor, uh, and for a professor to write a book which is truly readable, exciting, <laughs> clear, fast, is a minor miracle. And so I would like to remind you that you can get a signed copy of this book just outside this door. And I'd ask you to please join me in thanking not only Rick, but our other panelists. For